Hello everybody. I want to uh, show you a game today from Beal, round two, 1979. With the white pieces, we had the late, great Victor Korchnoi, one of the strongest grandmasters uh, never to become world champion. With the white pieces, and with the black pieces, a player named Hans Jörg Kinnell. And this game is important to me because this game is um, a game that I encountered a long, long time ago um, when I was first learning um, how to play against the Dutch defense. I was looking for, you know, for something offbeat so I didn't have to learn all of the, um, you know, main line preparation you know, against the Leningrad and Stonewall. I was just looking for something that I could, you know, be inspired by. And uh, I ran across this game, and today I want to share it with you. And actually, um, this game uh, helped me defeat um, a master player a um, long time ago by the name of James West. And um, it was funny because it was it was like I never looked at it really didn't need a Dutch theory, but I came across this game, and the game just kind of stuck in my head, like the themes. And uh, it was very interesting, so I want to share it with you, and I uh, hope you enjoy it also. So, of course, Noy played D4. Canel played F5. And, of course, Noy avoided all the main uh, <laughs> tabias and played h3 those of you who are familiar with the dutch you know that g3 is uh you know one of the main moves c4 of course and going into um you know a lot of theory of course e4 is possible to start the gambit <clears throat> but h3 is played and nowadays there are many anti-dutch systems of course g4 queen g4 not saying that they're good but Bishop G5 is an effective way to play. Knight C3 is played by Ivan Sokolov. But here, in 1979, H3 was played. Knight F6, right? Pretty normal. And, of course, the idea of H3 is very primitive. And it is to play the move G4 to deflect this f Pawn away from the e4 square. Um, there's several plans in the Dutch um, for white, and of course, there's a few for black, but just discussing from the white side, thinking about the white side, one of the main plans and most popular plan against the Dutch is to enforce the move e4 after d5. So, if we go back to the start position. If white could play another move right after d4, he would play e4. However, black gets the move according to the rules of chess. And so black in this particular defense decides to stop white's e4 advance by playing f4. Excuse me, f5. Now, of course, that comes at a price. We can see the a2 to g8 diagonal is weakened. And... That's where his king stays. And also the h5 to e8 diagonal is weakened. Okay, so this is why um, there's so many swift attacks um, in against the king in this opening. Because of this move f5. And this is one of the reasons why it's not uh, seen as much at the top levels consistently. Because of this early uh, weakening of the uh, king's shelter but meanwhile um, f5 clamps down on the e4 pawn and of course excuse me on the e4 square and in combination with moves like knight f6 d d5 in the stone wall right you get this script on e4 by black early in the game and it's very difficult uh, you know for white to just immediately uh, get e4 and it must be done with a lot of preparation so 
the idea behind moves H3 and then G4 is to deflect the pawn from F5 away from guardianship of the E4 square. So going back through the moves now, knight of six, we have a bit more understanding as to what's going on. So don't think H3 is just some type of dumb move that's just being thrown out there because Korsnoy didn't take the guy seriously. There's definitely an idea. Um, think of the Banco Gambit also where on the black side of the board, on the queen side, um, black gives up the um, A and B pawns for queen side counterplay. This is a similar idea except white is doing it on the king side. So F takes G4. So basically, black gives white what he's looking for here. And after I just explained to you the idea, perhaps that white is looking for is, as far as distracting the F5 pawn away from the guardianship E4, we can probably say in hindsight that D5 is probably better, right? We know that white wants to uh, deflect the pawn, so why not clamp down on E4 even more? And if G5, right, trying to get the knight away, we just jump right into the square. And then it would be very difficult to dislodge this knight. As F3 simply allows the knight to jump into G3. Okay. And this just helps black strengthen his grip on e4 even more and develops a piece okay so understanding your opponent's plans and ideas is very important so that you can um, stop them so here f takes d4 is played again black is not lost but again it gives white what he wants h takes d4 and now knight takes g4 so notice the things that I explained to you in the opening the purpose of f5 and knight f6 which is to control e4 square for the price of a pawn black has given up the control of the e4 square not only did it um, cost white a pawn <coughs> or only a pawn rather he also has an attack, so he gains time against the knight. Right? The knight is not defended. He also has the open G and H files, whereby to attack on the king side. And, again, recall the fact that I explained how the move F5 weakens the king side. So black has this organic weakness on the king side right out of the opening. All right? In order... Right, he accepts this weakness on the king side in the opening in order to clamp down on e4 square. So now, in the space of four moves, black, for the price of a pawn, or for, for a pawn, has given up his idea, his clamp on e4, and his king side is more exposed than ever as there are now two open files um, that white has to use on the... Um, King side. And one more thing, I mentioned to you the Banco Gambit. Notice how the G and H files are open. Now, for those of you new players that don't know what the Banco Gambit is, let me just show you really quick, because I don't want to bore the more experienced players, but I just want to make sure everybody can understand when I say certain things. I don't want people to be like, "What's the Banco Gambit?" Okay, this is known as the Banco Gambit. Pal Benko, Hungarian Grandmaster, great endgame specialist. Okay, so at the D5, this is your Benoni. Now, the Benoni would start after E6, but the the Benko Gambit sacrifices this flank pawn, right? So he takes B5 and then sacrifices another pawn. 
And there's many moves that can be played here, like B5 and such, but the old main line was just simply just to take. And I just want to leave it here, just to show you that notice how Black has the A and B files at his disposal now to use. So he has this perfect pawn structure. Easy development for his pieces. His his uh, pawn will go to d6, g6, bishop g7, castle. This knight will sometimes make its way to here to g4 to e5. Sometimes back here, here. His other rook will go here. So it's really easy play. This bishop will trade itself off for this bishop, and there will be tremendous pressure down these files for the price of a pawn. There he has it that after um, if white accepts both pawns, you know, takes on a6, that black can get a good game. So usually black will... Okay, not to, again, give black what he wants. So that's what I mean when I say it's kind of like a Bengo gambit, but on the other side of the board. So you see the h3, knight of 6, g4. And now you can understand looking at white's king side. The G and H files are open. And so, of course, you know, it gets what he wants. So, E4, knight is attacked, so that must be addressed. And now D6, so D6 uses the bishop to protect here. So what is White's plan? Now that he has his full center, his plan is pretty pretty simple, his plan of development. He simply wants to boot this knight out with f3, bishop here to e3, knight c3, queen d2, castle queen side, do something with this bishop, maybe d3. Or sometimes it can go to h3 or g2. And attack on the king side using this broad center to keep black restricted. <clears throat> Alright, so now the d6 was played. Bishop g5 by course, a very provocative move. Making it difficult to play any type of move with the e pawn. H6 can't really be played. <clears throat> so G6 intending on fan catering the bishop. F3. The knight just goes back to F6. And now knight c3. Now, we can say that white has good compensation for the pawn. I mean, I would take this. And this is, again, this position just is what intrigued me. So simple to play. And I said, wow, all of this for a pawn. You know, count me in. c6. Queen d2. Bishop e6, castle, and we can see the simplicity of white's development. Maybe d7, and black is is a little bit cramped and has to play a, a kind of cons uh, consolidation approach. Right? He can't be really active like he wants to in the Dutch. He's giving up the space, his center, and he's basically trying to hold on. Um, for an end game where he can be a pawn up and hopefully um, realize those this past pawn on the H file. King B1. Notice how Korsner has the time just to fully complete his king side cast queen side castling by King B1. Bishop G7. Knight goes to H3. And the knight wants to go to F4. Notice. 
this guy here just hanging out. And now knight h5. The idea is to stop the uh, white knight from coming there. Knight f4 anyway. Bishop h6 is also um, playable. That looks pretty good for a uh, white also. But knight f4. Knight takes. And now queen takes. This makes, again, cat now castling is not possible. <clears throat> and if rook f8, then the queen could just drop back to uh, g3. However, after queen takes f4, queen b6 is played with this double attack um, on the pawn right here. And black would like to castle queen side here, but then this pawn is unprotected. And then this pawn will be unprotected after this one's captured. Queen d2. And now queen c7. Again. That would just simply be met by bishop takes e7, and then this pawn... It's going to drop also. I have to say rook d e 8. So he has to go to queen c 7. Now queen e 3. And again playing against black's ideas. And this is very important. This to me I think this, this um underrated discipline in chess is playing against the opponent's ideas sometimes we get focused on like our own like our own plans in the position and don't think about stopping you know the opponent like playing you know prof uh, their prophylactic style this is why you don't hear much talk about players like like Petrosian um, you do I mean somewhat you know, but diehard chess fans, but like when you, you know, people mention the great champions, you know, it's like, oh, Kasparov, Tal, you know, things like that. But you don't hear about the quiet guys, you know, Petrosian, Karpov, you know, that style of of preventing the opponent's ideas. That's why it was like they won a lot of games where it looked like they didn't do too much or the games looked like overly simple because they would just stop. The ideas of the opponent, and then the opponent would just get squeezed to death, because they would stop the ideas of the opponent and then implement their own ideas, and that was the game. And you'd be like, "What happened?" You know. <laughs> so here, Korsnoy plays Queen E3, and of course, you had this idea D5, and again, it's difficult to castle Queen side. He knows he knows what um, White wants to do. Excuse me, what black wants to do. Black wants to castle over here, but then you got this E pawn here, and he makes sure that he can attack this also. Okay, and then, of course, if black tries to castle on the king side, it's a wrap with these two open files already weak in king side. So he's kind of forcing black to stay in the middle. And that's bad too, because D5, that's going to. Open up the open up the position in the, in the middle of the board. So this is a, a strong, very strong play by uh, Korsnoy here. Again, all for the price of a pawn. So knight b6. So he tries to black tries to play against this idea, but you know he's almost there right now. This this pawn is protected. He stopped the idea of, you know, his d5 with with the queen being able to take. So now it looks like he's all ready to just uh, castle here. But, of course, now he plays d5. Bishop f7. And black is a strong player, too. He's trying to keep things, things calm himself. 
And now here, Corson only plays a4, just keeping the keeping the pressure on in a position. Castle's queen side. Then a5. Knight d7, and this pawn was gonna fall. Knight a8, and this pawn will fall. So you can see the constant play against the ideas of queenside castling. No rest for the king, for the black king. So now a6 is played. So now, of course, you now he shifts play into high gear. Now he plays a risky continuation here. And he plays a move e5. This gives black this gives black some 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 counter chances. Right? So he takes this he takes the shot. Um less risky would have been a move again like bishop h6. Alright. And black can opt for trying to repeat somehow maybe with bishop f6 and bishop g5 or something like that like if he takes here then now maybe castling and white's position is a bit better of course what goes for it here he just plays h5 and bishop takes e5 if knight takes d5 here, knight takes, <coughs> c takes, e6, bishop g8, bishop h6, bishop f6, and rook d5. And um, black's pieces look horrible boxed in on the king side like that. So bishop takes e5. Course, now he plays f4, opening up the position. D takes, B takes, and he puts his bishop on g2. Now, if he tries to take here, for instance, bishop takes e7, queen takes e7, and queen takes b6, then kingside castle, and queen takes c6, and rook fc8 with a lot of counterplay. Here, because now you have the open B C files, Bishop point nine on C three, Rook on C eight. So you have to get the nod to black there. It's a little bit too much um, pawn grabbing right there. So this is why Corsnoy just kept developing and played Bishop G two. Here he plays the move Knight C eight. Concerned about the defense of this uh, e7 pawn. However, rook b8 is clearly better. As you can see, the powerful um, attacking possibilities that um, are inherent here. Because now you can see the rook bearing down on the b file in combination with the bishop. The bishops, the bishop pair on these open diagonals, and you can easily see the knight coming here to c4. Okay, so this is an opportunity that was missed in the game by um, by black. So continuing on with this line, if rook d1. Then e6, again with the idea of the knight going to c4. Again, after rook b8, if bishop takes c6 check, by trying to trick, you know, trick uh, black into getting checkmated. Of course, not queen takes c6, getting made it, but just... Stepping over with the king. Okay, so just so you know, rook b8. That was that was the move that Black needed to try to turn the tides here. 
Instead, he played a real passive move in knight c8. Knight e4. And you can tell at this point that um, Black is somewhat mesmerized by his opponent's um, attacking um, posture in the game. Um, sometimes you get, it's like a psychological thing that happens. Like if your opponent has been attacking you for a long time, sometimes it can be hard to um, begin to counterattack. You're so used to defending, so you just keep defending. You you know, he this guy is probably settled on defense as early as move ten. As soon as he saw the big center go up by white and the castle and queen side by white, he's like, Oh, I gotta defend. I'm up a, I'm up a pawn, I need to defend. So he's not he's not um catching not seeing the counter chance chances in the position. So he plays his move king f eight, which Against the defensive move, it gets off the, you know, he's worried about moves like knight e6, excuse me, knight d6, and the pin, pinning possibilities and stuff like that. Where again, rook b8. Why not give black something to, uh, white something to think about on b2? What's what's does Corsinoy play here? He has to play a move like b3, right? He has to take time and do something, you know, that he doesn't want to do. Instead, king f8. At the king f8, Corsnoy says, hey, I got to get rid of that bishop. Okay. So, this move is very important, especially after I showed you the last variations. White is simply exchanging, the, you know, the most important piece in the, in the Leningrad set, Dutch setup. Now, he's a move behind. He plays rook b8. Here, black has to just play a move, you know, like that. Of course, white is better. So, he's like a step behind. Now, he plays rook b8. And, here, of course, now he plays a very powerful move. If you want to pin, uh, excuse me, pause the video and, um, Try to figure out what Korsnoy played at this point. You know, be my guest. Okay, so you had some time to pause it and find the move. Here, Korsnoy played the move queen c3. Very strong, exploiting the fact that after bishop h6, the bishop is pinned. Okay, so we have a double pin all of a sudden. Rook g8. And now the attack is in full gear. Knight h5. Bishop takes h6. Rook takes. And now rook g7. There's no protection to h7, so knight takes h7 check. King g8. And of course, now he plays queen. H3. Of course, Rook H1 could have been played also. Queen B7. Threatening mate on B3. Knight F6 check. Of course, the knight can't be taken because of Rook H8 mate. King F8. Rook H8. Bishop G8. Knight D7. King F7. <clears throat> if King E8, then just simply Knight takes B8. And King F7, same thing. Knight takes B8. Queen takes B8, so it eliminates that um, threat. Bishop takes C6. Knight B6. Rook E1. King F6, Queen H4, check. G5. And F takes G5. And Canel resigned. So that was a um, very instructive game. Hope you enjoyed it. And, um, you know, if you're looking for something, you know, having trouble 
against um, one at five in the Dutch, maybe this plan is right up your alley. Easy to recall the ideas and uh, fun to play with the white pieces. So anyway, that is the end uh, for this video. And uh, I'll be making some more. And I'll see you on the next one. Please comment, like, suggest, and subscribe. And I'll talk to you all later.